Welcome to the Facebook studio at Raisina Dialogue 2020. To discuss the subject of is arms control over, we have with us Daniel Feeks from the UN and Professor Lavina Lee from Australia. Let me pose a first question to you. Post World War II, most arms control agreements have focused on specific weapon systems, nuclear, chemical, biological, landmines and so on. Given that global politics has changed, is it first necessary to get a political order right before we can start talking of arms control? Or can we talk still of arms control? Any of you, please. It's, this is very informal. Do you like to go? Yes, sure, no problem. Um, well, thank you, first of all, for, for the panel for organizing this today as well. Um, I think one thing to say at the beginning is when we talk about arms control, we should also talk about other um, treaties as well, talk about the wider concept of disarmament as well. Arms control is very much about limiting and regulating, for example, numbers of uh, different types of weapons system. In the United Nations um, and the office that I work in, we are the Office for Disarmament Affairs. So we also work on disarmament, which is you know, very different to the idea of just limiting numbers of weapons. It's actually about completely prohibiting um, weapons systems. And you mentioned a few of those just now, for example, chemical and biological weapons, landmines and cluster munitions as well. So there are disarmament treaties alongside arms control treaties and non-proliferation treaties as well. So I think the whole package of those is something that's, that's very important and the political order that we have for and the, the global framework that we have for arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation is something that's very important and something that really needs needs to be maintained. It's in a certain um, the Secretary General of the United Nations has said it's in a certain moment of um, crisis at the moment, and it's something that we need to to maintain those. But we also need to look to the future to see what new types of instruments we may need for to to deal with challenges down the line in the future. Yeah, but I mean, the point is that for the last 20 years, we've seen nothing in disarmament, let alone, and nothing in even in arms control mm -hmm. for the last 10 years or so. So is it that we are following the wrong horse? Or is it that we should be looking at crafting a new political order? Because what do you think about it? My um, expertise is mostly in the nuclear proliferation regime. So I'll leave Daniel for, for the Well, we can biological. move to nuclear. You know, right. one of the key tenets yes. of nuclear arms control has always been that a nuclear war cannot be won and therefore must not be fought. Mm -hmm. Now, is this still hold or has the use of nuclear weapons become more likely? Um, I, before I talk about that, I probably want to go back to your earlier question sure. about um, new powers in the system. Um, now, I think the probably what your question is also alluding to is, is countries like North Korea, Iran, uh, who are uh, not part of the great power system, but are challenging the nuclear order in, in different ways. Now, I think they have been challenging the nuclear order for some time. Um, there's uh, challenges of enforcement, um, of monitoring and effectiveness of the existing non-proliferation treaty. Um, now, I think the credibility of the non-proliferation treaty has been challenged by the inability of uh, the international community to do much about North Korea and Iran. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily uh, a crisis of the system as such. So when you say that do we need to effectively go back to the drawing board and start again, I don't think that that's the case. I think it's more about um, reforming, well, reforming the treaty. The NPT has been enormously successful as a treaty. There are only four countries outside it. Absolutely. And it has now lasted for 50 years. And yet, why is it that people are suddenly getting nervous about the NPT? I mean, if you were a betting person, and we, this year we have the NPT review mm -hmm. conference, um, how many more years before it either gets replaced by something or it collapses? 10 years? 20 years? Mm. Well, Any of you want to take a bet on it? <laughs> I'm not a betting man myself, so I won't, <laughs> I won't engage in that. But uh, like you said, the the NPT review conference coming up um, in a couple of months' time is, is a really important landmark um, in the terms of the whole overall framework for non-proliferation um, in the world at the moment. And so there's a lot of focus already on that review conference and people are very much focusing on the conference itself and whether the conference will be a success or a failure. And in different areas, we've seen conferences that have been successful, including in the NPT, also in the Chemical Weapons Convention. You can say that the conference is a success or a failure 
But even if a conference, one specific conference is deemed to be a failure, the treaty continues. The treaty remains, the treaty carries on, and I think it's important that, you know, particularly given the, the geopolitical tensions that there are in the world at the moment, and the Secretary General of the United Nations has said this himself, that, you know, arms control, um, disarmament treaties can play a role even at a time like this, when they are under challenge, when the geopolitical situation may not seem to be ideal. Treaties, arms control, discussions, disarmament treaties can play a role in reducing tensions, in building trust between countries. We just look back to the Cold War. Many of these treaties that we're discussing, for example, the Biological Weapons Convention that I deal with, um, was finalized in the early 1970s. This is the depths of the Cold War. And, you know, so things could be done then. So I don't see, and the Secretary General himself said, you know, it's times like this when we really need to be looking at these issues and to be discussing. True. But Daniel, as you yourself said, uh, many of these treaties were concluded during the period of the Cold War. Now, the Cold War was marked by an age of two nuclear superpowers. Sure. And it was an age of uh, parity between the two nuclear superpowers. Today, it is an age of asymmetry. Mm -hmm. And we don't really have a new model for uh, a relationship between major powers of the day. And that is why even a treaty like the NPT, which is otherwise such a successful treaty, seems to be shaky because of one country or two countries. It sounds, doesn't say much for the resilience of the uh, non-proliferation structures. I'd still say, maybe controversially. Sure. Uh, maybe controversially. When, um, when Donald Trump started his maximum pressure campaign against North Korea, mm -hmm. um, I think the general consensus was, uh, what's he doing? You know, does he really know what he's doing? But Is North Korea or Iran? North, North Korea, Korea first. Okay. North Korea first. So I, I looked at it in terms of, as you said, it is about asymmetry. Um, so these smaller powers, they use nuclear weapons to, as great equalizers um, to balance out their weaker positions. Um, but I would say that, that you're right to say that both North Korea and Iran demonstrated that the costs and benefit calculations that they were making about attempting to um, acquire nuclear weapons, successfully acquire them in the case of North Korea, um, that balance between costs and benefits, there were, there were limited costs to them for taking that path. So there was poor enforcement, uh, poor political consensus about what to do about North Korea, um, about the sanctions regime. Um, and I think what was interesting about the maximum pressure campaign against North Korea is that it demonstrated that the sanctions that had been applied against North Korea were never actually that stringent. It was only until Donald Trump, uh, one, put um, uh, the threat of military, uh, a military response on the table you think and Kim Jong-un was scared? I do, actually. Oh, okay. I do actually think that for the first time in a very long time, he thought that there was a, a crazy man in, in the United <laughs> States that just might um, do something. And that forced both China and North Korea to mm -hmm. change their costs and benefit calculations. Um, and the fact that China, for the first time, actually was enforcing the sanctions regime quite strictly did uh, place a great deal of pressure on North Korea. So now, where would you <laughs> say North Korea will go now after two summits? I, okay, my, my criticism, so I was being quite hmm. uh, complimentary of uh, the Trump administration then. Um, I, I was actually very disappointed that he in announced the summit in the ah, first place. Okay. Because I think that took the pressure off. And now it's going to be much more difficult two years later after two failed summits to get that kind of political consensus back again on North Korea. I'm not saying that it's not possible, but... Um, so that will depend on whether Trump himself wins his second term. Which I think he will. <laughs> well, let me turn yeah. to you, Daniel, and ask you something. You've been working for years to preserve and strengthen the Biological Weapons Convention. With technological breakthroughs in synthetic biology, does it make it easier to design and modify new pathogens? And if so, how will the BWC preserve itself or strengthen itself in, let's say, the next decade or so? Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's a, it's a great question. It's one of the big challenges which we now face 
um, in terms of implementing the Biological Weapons Convention, and many states parties always raise this issue of advances in science and technology. Now, obviously, many of these advances bring great benefits to humanity. Sci you know, synthetic absolutely. biology that you mentioned, yeah. genome New editing. medicines, vaccines, and all the rest of I it. I exactly, and you absolutely. know, 99% of these will be used for exactly those purposes, and people go into, you know, young students going into biology these days are going into biology for just those right reasons. But there's always the chance, not just with synthetic biology, but with many of these new technologies, even with physics, as we saw you know, from after the Second World War, after the atomic bombings, technologies can be misused, and historically they have been misused. The chances are that someone somewhere down the line will misuse any of these new technologies that we're talking about, not just in relation to biology. They will, unfortunately, be misused. So we have to be aware of that. Our treaties, our institutions have to be agile and adaptable to be able to keep pace with these new technologies. And the people working in these fields, the technologists, the scientists, they also need to be aware of these issues as well. And obviously many of them are aware of them, but they need to be constantly reminded and constantly engaged with, interacted with, and made to you know, consider not just the positive implications of what they're doing, but also the negative, in, the possible negative. In Daniel, you brought in technologies. Now, in recent years, we've seen an increasing use of drones, mm -hmm. both in lethal application as well as for surveillance and so on. Today, with developments that are taking place in artificial intelligence and robotics, there is a growing tendency towards lethal autonomous weapon systems. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people feel that were these to be employed in another war, it would probably be less destructive and maybe cause less casualties. And so therefore, that is the direction to go. Any final thoughts on that? I mean, it, it's one of these issues we don't have in terms of lethal autonomous weapon systems. We don't have an existing treaty um, you know, regulating their, their use and the, you know, definitions and everything. That's not there yet. There are discussions which are taking place at the United Nations in Geneva um, in recent years. But it, it's one of those areas in which we need, as I mentioned just now, we need to be thinking about the implications of both the, the benefits. You mentioned drones, you know, artificial intelligence. There are huge, you know, massive benefits for all of these technologies, but there is also the potential of their misuse as well. Sure. And whether but they would will be better... You Even know, if it is used in weapon systems, mm -hmm. would it make for a less destructive war? Well, that's one of the arguments that, that people you know, in favor of these weapon systems will use. I don't, Lavina, did you to add something? I, I would say, I'm, look, I'm not an expert on this, but I, I think you could also say the opposite, um, because you are not actually risking human life, um, that it's almost a, a much easier decision for a polit politician to make to wage war if you can use systems that don't risk your own troops. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, there's a risk the other way. Well, thank you very much. And let me come back once more to the nuclear issue. And you'll just have about 30 seconds each. In the sense that uh, in an age of asymmetry, how do you bring about a new nuclear regime? Because now it will not be based on bipolarity. Throughout the Cold War, US had one enemy and Soviet Union had one enemy. Today, the US perceives two strategic adversaries. Russia still perceives only one. So here is a fundamental conundrum. Any ways to resolve it? Um, I actually think that the fundamentals of the nuclear proliferation regime are secure in that, as you said, there's only four countries outside of it. And the general consensus is that we don't want to see a spread of nuclear weapons, and that's something that's shared, I think, with, between most non-nuclear weapon states and nuclear weapon states. So I think it's about actually implementing the treaty as it is. Um, I think a really big problem that hasn't been resolved is um, sensitive nuclear technology. Should that actually be part of um, the bargain, the grand bargain, whether access to that should be given to non-nuclear weapon states? And that is the, the real um, risk, is the crossover between civilian and military uses is in that access to sensitive technologies. Can you? Um, nuclear weapons isn't, isn't my area as such. I mentioned already the, the nuclear, the non-proliferation review conference, which is coming up in a couple of months' time, which will obviously be uh, a key event in this area. There's also one other issue is the um, Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. It's a treaty that was negotiated many years ago, but hasn't yet entered into force as well. So there needs, I think there will also be a tension there. And then as, as you know, um, 
in the last couple of years, there's been the negotiation of the um, treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons well, as well. Yes, I know. That has changed. It has also thrown up a number of contradictions. Thank you very much, both of you, for a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.